you. Welcome to worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you are new to Trinity, we invite you to scan the QR code in your bulletin. That will bring you to a place where you can share a little of your contact information with us, and we can share a little with you about what's happening in our life together. We have a few announcements this morning before we begin our time of worship. There are numerous opportunities today to gather and fellowship and grow together, so we want to highlight those for you. First, immediately after worship, we have our monthly potluck. The theme this morning is eating around the world, since it's World Communion Sunday. Whether you brought anything with you or not, there's always plenty of food. We have dishes and everything you need, so please come join us after worship for our potluck. Then this afternoon at 2.30, there is an intergenerational game of Ultimate Frisbee happening at Harrison Park School. You are welcome to come and participate in that. And then tonight at 6 p.m. at Third Reformed Church, the Room for All Churches of Grand Rapids are hosting a screening of the documentary 1946, focused on the Revised Standard Translation of the Bible that came out in that year. The film explores biblical translation and interpretation, interpersonal relationships and conflicts, as well as human sexuality. So it's fascinating, and we're going to be showing it at 6 p.m. at Third Reformed Church, so you are invited to join us. There will be childcare and snacks provided. Now, Glenn has an announcement about an upcoming opportunity with Together West Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us feel a bit powerless when we think of wanting to change things in our world, whether it's in our own neighborhoods or um, the war in Middle East. Um, this Saturday, October 12, you have a chance to feel some power with other people of uh, goodwill and Christian faith who are coming together on October 12, this Saturday at 10 o'clock on the southeast side uh, to hold candidates running for office this fall accountable to some of the values that we hold and some of the uh, policies and programs that we'd like to see put forward as Together West Michigan. We, our goal is to get 12 Trinity folks there. I think we're at seven or eight uh, as I, when I last looked at the registration. If, if you're not thinking about it, I invite you to do so. And if you have been thinking about it but just haven't registered, uh, please do so as soon as possible. If you need to talk to, uh, to anyone about that, see Jan Koopman or Susan's here or myself or Ben. Um, but we want to get uh, four or five more people who are willing to come and join um, the, the group on Saturday morning. Thank you. Now, as we begin our time of worship, I invite you to turn in your red hymnals to number 107, and we'll sing together, Come Light, Light of God. Come light, light of God, overwhelm all creation, and lighten our hearts, let your light dwell in us. Come light, light of God, overwhelm all creation, and lighten our hearts, let your light invite you to rise and body your spirit as God calls us to worship. Throughout all ages and places, 
God has spoken the message of peace and reconciliation in nature, in the words of the prophets, in story and history. With every good thing, God has revealed God's love. In the fullness of time, God sent Christ into the world to show us in human form God's way of living and loving. We join with God's children around the world to receive the gospel of hope and healing once more. We open ourselves to the transforming spirit of God. Let's turn in our green hymnals to number 156, and we'll sing together, clap your hands, all you nations. Clap your hands, all you nations, hallelujah. Shout for joy, all you Amen, hallelujah. Holy is the most high. Amen, hallelujah. Mighty over the earth. Amen, hallelujah. God subdues every nation. Amen, hallelujah. God is king of all creatures. Amen, hallelujah. God has given this land, amen, hallelujah, to the people he loves, amen, hallelujah, to the shouting in triumph, amen, hallelujah, to the blessing of trumpets, amen, hallelujah, God has come, has gone. Amen, hallelujah, God ascends over all, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord with your singing, amen, hallelujah, sing God's songs forever, amen, hallelujah, God is monarch of all, amen, hallelujah. Sovereign over the earth, amen, hallelujah. Those on earth who are mighty, amen, hallelujah. Still belong to our maker, amen, hallelujah. God exalted on high, amen, hallelujah. God forever of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Siblings in Christ, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have a high priest who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So let us now approach God's throne with boldness, trusting in God's steadfast love and power to forgive. Wondrous God, who sets sun and moon above us, mountains and valleys beneath us, friends and strangers among us, we confess how often we have tried to hide from your presence. How seldom have we looked for your hand. Lord, have mercy upon us. Wondrous God, who took on flesh in Christ Jesus to show us the fullness of your love, we confess how often we have forgotten you. How seldom have we truly loved and followed you. Christ, have mercy upon us. Amen. 
wondrous God, who freely pours out your Holy Spirit, we confess how often we have ignored your promptings. How seldom have we asked for your help or accepted your gifts. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Siblings in Christ, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are assured there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive, no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. Since we have this great high priest, may we know that we can receive mercy and grace in our time of need. In Christ, God accepts, God forgives, and God sets free. Receive the forgiving love of God. Thanks be to God. Having been forgiven in Christ, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share Christ's peace together. Good morning, friends. Will you help me sing our prayer for illumination? Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God. Anybody know what special day the church is celebrating today? Esther? World Communion Sunday. So I have a new book to share with you guys that is all about communion. It's called Gathered at the Table. You might see a few paper clips. I'm not going to read the entire book, but it'll be here if you want to look at it later. Yep. Communion is a beautiful, holy, mysterious gift. When we gather at the table to share bread and wine, God's invisible spirit hovers in the air just like it did over 2,000 years ago when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. It was evening in Jerusalem. Jesus knew he didn't have long to live on earth. What could he do to help his friends remember how he had lived and loved? Jesus did something very special. In the quietness of that room, Jesus called his disciples to the table. As they watched and listened, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to each of them. Then he took wine, poured it out, and gave that to his disciples too. And as he did, Jesus softly said, whenever you eat bread, remember me. Whenever you drink wine, remember me. Ever since that night, Christians all around the world are called to the table too, as we celebrate communion and remember Jesus. We hear the mysterious words Jesus spoke to his disciples. Ah. 
This is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do this in memory of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is poured out for you. And we wonder what those mysterious words might mean for us. There are different names for this special meal. It can be called Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist. The bread can be one large loaf or little wafers. The wine or grape juice can be in one large cup or in little ones. We may gather around a table, kneel at an altar, or stay in our seats. But no matter what this special meal is called, and no matter how we receive it, we remember as we take communion that Jesus chose to give his life for us. What wonderful love. Some children attend a special class to learn about communion and what it means. Their first Holy Communion is a very special, exciting event, and all the family celebrates. In other churches, even babies are welcome to take communion. But no matter how old we are, whether we attend a class or not, we know that in communion we are one family, joined together in the love of Jesus. When we get ready to take communion, Jesus knows exactly how we feel. If our hearts are heavy or sad, if we've messed up or feel unloved, Jesus knows. And as we reach out for the bread and wine, Jesus reaches out to us and fills us with love, forgiveness, and hope. As we leave the communion table, God's presence goes with us. We step out into the world reminded of how Jesus taught us to live and love. We rise from the table wrapped in the goodness and grace of God, forgiven, loved, and called to share the love of Jesus however and wherever we can. One special day every year, today. Millions of Christians all around the world celebrate World Communion Sunday. Indoors and outdoors, in churches and homes, in cities and on farms, by lake shores and under tents, people remember Jesus as they break bread. The bread might be brown or white, large or little, flat or fluffy, but the color and size and kind don't matter. What matters is that just like the different breads, each one of us represents one big, beautiful, diversely different family gathered across God's globe to remember Jesus. What? You eat bread almost every day? Yeah. No matter how or where or when communion is celebrated, Jesus stands at the head of every table, reaches out his hands, smiles, and says, Come, come to the table. People will come from east and west and north and south. They will take their places at the feast in God's kingdom. Luke 13, 29. You guys pray with me dear god thank you for giving us the gift of communion help us to remember our friends all around the world today as we celebrate and to share your love with others this week amen all right today if you are going down to little lambs you can follow asher and if you are staying here there's some stuff in the children's resource area for you For those of us who are remaining in the sanctuary, our song of preparation is number 320 in our red hymnal. Gracious Spirit, heed our pleading. We'll sing the first three verses. Gracious Spirit, heed our pleading. Fashion us all anew. It's your leading that we're needing. Help us to follow you. Come, 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 Holy Spirit, come. Come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
Come to teach us, come to nourish those who believe in Christ. Bless the faithful, may they flourish, strengthened by grace and pride. Come, 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 Holy Spirit, come. Come, 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 Holy Spirit, come. Guide our thinking and our speaking, done in your holy Motivate all in their seeking, freeing from guilt and shame. Come, 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 Holy Spirit, come. Come, 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 Holy Spirit. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 26. You can find that on page 437 in our Sanctuary Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty, those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And our second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. It's on page 971 in our Sanctuary Bibles. We'll read from chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Listen again for the word of God. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. 
You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. These are the famous opening lines of William Butler Yeats's poem, The Second Coming. The poem was written in the aftermath of World War I, and it anticipates the unraveling of human civilization. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. These words also apply to the people who first read the letter to the Hebrews. We don't know precisely who these people were or where they lived. We don't know precisely who wrote this letter, but there are some good clues we can learn from in the letter itself. We're going to spend the next four Sundays at Trinity exploring the letter to the Hebrews paying attention to these clues and getting to know what we can about this Hebrews community, who they are, what they've been going through, how things are now falling apart, and what God is doing in the midst of them. This Hebrews community, wherever it is, is full of converts to Christianity. We know these people are primarily converts because, one, Christianity is brand new in the first century, and external references to this letter uh, indicate it was written before 95 CE, and two, because this letter talks about what we heard from those who heard him. The readers and writer of this letter heard firsthand apostolic witnesses of the risen Christ proclaiming the gospel message. They themselves experienced the signs, wonders, and miracles that accompanied that gospel message and verified its validity. So this community was formed with the the charged energy of a convert's zeal. They were baptized and discipled into a way of life in which they willingly forsook participation in the many idolatrous ceremonies of their Roman city. It takes a convert's zeal to stay different than one's neighbors, to resist the relentless social pressure to conform. But this Hebrews community did it, and some of them suffered for it. We read that they were seen as subversives for not acknowledging the claims of the Roman gods, Their neighbors suspected them of undermining the state, the law, the family, all the traditional values of their society. And all cultures have ways of enforcing their norms. When these Christ followers dared to be different, their neighbors dishonored and disgraced them, attempting to shame them into conformity. Some in the Hebrews community experienced verbal assaults on their character. 
Some endured the spectacle of a public trial and time in prison. Some had their property legally seized or illegally looted. Being disgraced, insulted, or robbed would be a big deal to us too, but it was an even bigger deal in this honor-shame culture. I've read that in an honor-shame culture, the idea of self-esteem doesn't make any sense. What you think about yourself is irrelevant. The only esteem one has is what is bestowed by the group. Now, we still care what our neighbors think about us, but we don't care nearly as much as the Hebrews community cared about what their neighbors thought. And their neighbors were actively reviling them for following Christ. Yet in the initial formation of this marginalized Hebrews community, they embody brave solidarity with one another. In chapter 10, the author of Hebrews writes, Recall those earlier days when, after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to insults and afflictions, and sometimes becoming partners with, thus, with those so treated. For you had compassion for those who were in prison. These people willingly endured disgrace for one another. They generously set aside their honor, the most precious currency in their culture, to be with their fellow Christ followers in the midst of their disgrace. The sacrificial love embodied in this community is beautiful to behold. But the cost of that lost honor was very real. Cultural anthropologists note the close connection in honor-shame cultures between a person's level of honor and the treatment of that person's body. For instance, the, the stolen property meant not only losing what the people had possessed, it also meant losing what they could get. Without access to the tools of their trades, their shops, their good reputations, people in the Hebrews community struggled to regain economic stability. As part of a disgraced, subversive minority, their society relentlessly, actively punished them. The Hebrews community bore up under this intense pressure and attempted to grind out a good life in the face of persecution. Every day, they strained to remain loyal to God and to one another. But eventually, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. By the time the letter to the Hebrews is written, the community is in danger of dissolving. The congregation is dwindling as people grow weary and lose heart. We don't know if people were returning to Orthodox Judaism, which was much older and more socially accepted, or if people were just returning to the motions of Roman religion. We do know the remnant of this congregation is tired of enduring shame. They are buckling under the weight of being relentlessly disgraced. Although we live in a different time and place, the weariness of the Hebrews community resonates with us too. We may look around at the wider church on this World Communion Sunday and feel despair as the church we know falls apart. People are drifting away, perhaps to avoid the infection of white nationalism, or the false god of doctrinal purity, or the irrelevance of a cheap grace that costs nothing and promises no movement toward justice. How can sharing a meal hold this church together? Or even if we just think about Trinity, how will we, year after year, keep paying the ever-inflating bills 
while committing meaningful missional muscle to the flourishing of our neighborhood, city, and world? How do we individually not drift away? People do it all the time. There's pressure pushing us in that direction right now. Some of us probably feel like we are in the midst of drifting away. Others of us might be drifting away and not know it yet. How do we hold this together? How do we keep all that is good and precious about our life as the people of God, even as we're disillusioned by the reality of all that is bad? In the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a couple is so disillusioned with their relationship that drifting apart isn't enough. The movie begins with Joel discovering that his former girlfriend, Clementine, has had a procedure to have her memories of him erased. Heartbroken, Joel decides to undergo the same procedure and have his memories of her erased. When the procedure's underway, Joel is asleep, but he still re-experiences each memory of Clementine as it falls apart. The first memory to be erased is the most recent one, and it's from their last fight. Joel cheers as that memory crumbles. But as the procedure gets back to earlier, happier memories, Joel realizes that he does not want to forget the best times with Clementine. Eventually, he cries out, I don't want this anymore. I want to call it off. But he's asleep. He can't do it. Joel frantically tries to hide memories of Clementine inside other unrelated memories, but in the end, he can't hold on to any of them. They all fall apart. What hope can we have when things fall apart? The, letters to the, the letter to the Hebrews offers us some of the most uh, sophisticated Greek in the New Testament. But the hope given to this weary community is simple. It is Jesus. Even when things fall apart, even when we let go, Jesus holds us. The writer of Hebrews reminds the Hebrews community that Jesus is the creator of worlds, the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's being, the sustainer of all things, and Jesus is way better than the angels. Now, most of chapters 1 and 2 of this letter are about, are about Jesus being superior to angels. That may seem like a strange fixation to us. But these opening chapters aren't really about angels. They're about Jesus and honor. A community weary of living in disgrace is reminded of Jesus' story, how Jesus willingly set aside honor and was made low. Jesus was persecuted, disgraced, abused, and executed. Jesus' body was treated with no honor. But it is precisely because Jesus embodied self-giving love even unto death on the cross that God raises Jesus up and crowns Jesus with glory and honor. Now there is no one on earth or in heaven more honored. Jesus is way superior to the angels. Jesus walked this downward path that the, Hebrew that the Hebrews community is on, and now Jesus has been raised to the highest heights. This same Jesus holds the Hebrews community right now. The most honored one honors them in the midst of their disgrace. Jesus calls these people siblings, proclaims their names, praises them. They are esteemed. Their, may, their neighbors may not be impressed, but Jesus is there, present with them in their sufferings, sharing with them in their disgrace, working with them for justice, and promising they will be made new. Jesus is the center. 
the one who holds them even when things fall apart. Because they are held, they can fail and try again. They can lose their faith only to find a deeper version. They can choose to generously share in another's sufferings even though there's a cost. They can move forward, daring greatly, confident in the hope of a world made new. In the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Clementine and Joel find each other again even after their memories of each other are erased. And this seems like a dream ending. Now they can start their relationship over from scratch without the pain of the past. Then someone connected to the memory erasing facility sends them each tape recordings they made before the operation describing their bitter memories of each other. Now they are disillusioned again. Now they can't have a fresh start. Now they know the troublesome dynamics that will soon emerge in their renewed relationship. Joel protests, I can't think of anything I don't like about you right now. Clementine says, but you will. You will think of things. And I'll get bored with you and feel trapped because that's what happens with me. They pause on the edge of everything falling apart again. And Joel smiles and says, okay. And Clementine smiles and says, okay. The movie ends with them embracing their disillusionment and committing to start again. We're invited to imagine them forging a new, deeper version of their life together. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, writing in Germany as World War II was about to break out, says, By sheer grace, God will not permit us to live, even for a brief period, in a dream world. The sooner this shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and to a community, the better for both. A community which cannot bear such a crisis, which insists upon keeping its illusion, sooner or later will collapse. Christian solidarity is not an ideal which we must realize. It is rather a reality created by God in Christ in which we may participate. Neither of us can ever live by our own words and deeds, but only by that one word and deed which really binds us together, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. We enter into that common life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. Because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians long before we entered into the common life with them. Friends, on this day when the church is dwindling, when things are falling apart, when we may even find ourselves drifting away, Hear the good news that Jesus is our center, and Jesus holds us still. In our disillusionment, we can start again with a fuller picture of reality. We can forgive one another, knowing we need to be forgiven. We can fall in love with the story of Jesus again in a, in a new, deeper way. Again, we are invited to say, okay, to the selfless love embodied when Jesus took on our flesh. Okay, to the power of nonviolence overcoming violence on the cross. Okay, to the one superior to angels embracing us in our pain. Okay, to the mystery of God's presence making each moment of life a gift. Okay to the call to live generously and risk everything, trusting that the God of resurrection will make us new. So may we join with our siblings around the world 
and share the meal in which Christ holds us together. May we let go of every illusion and participate in the reality of our solidarity. May we live with glad and generous hearts, thankful for the new depths we are invited to discover in Christ every day. We thank you, God, for holding us in your word and your spirit, forming and shaping us even in those moments when we let go. We ask for your spirit to guide us to, to grow and try again, to seek to participate ever more fully in the grace of this life. Help us to live as your forgiven people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response is in our order of worship. I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing, May the Love of God. celebrating communion with us, we invite you to follow those around you as we come forward to receive the elements. This morning we'll have one station, so you're invited to come forward through this aisle, receive the elements, and then return to your seats through this aisle. If you wish to remain in your seat, just raise a hand and a server will bring the elements to you where you are. Please know that all who seek to follow Christ are welcome here at Christ's table. Let's begin our great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks and praise. Oh, 
soften the earth with your love. You shower the fields with your rain and give to our hungry bodies and souls a bountiful gifts of your grace. Christ, you became embodied in the world to redeem all that you have made. Send your Holy Spirit upon us now, that this bread and cup, the fruit of the earth, may be to us the body and blood of Christ. At supper with the disciples, Christ took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the hope of all creation in Christ. The hope of the ends of the earth, our terror and war you will see. bread of life given for us. Let, Let all who hunger, hunger come and eat. eat. This is the fruit of the vine poured out for us. Let, Let all who thirst come and drink. These are the gifts of God for, for all, all of creation. creation. Let us come for all things are now ready. The people on a journey, pain is with us all the way. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Your people get the invitation. To the humble and the poor, joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. 
this is bread that God provides us, nourishing our unity. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Christ is ever present with us to unite us all in love. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. All who truly thirst for justice seek their liberation here. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Joyfully we come together at the holy feast of God. Throughout our prayer this morning, I will say the words, we are your children, and you are invited to respond together, hear our prayer. Let's begin our prayer with those words now. Holy God, we are your children, hear our prayer. Holy and righteous God, you have gathered us at this meal with Christ as our host, with our siblings from every time and every place. We glimpse them across the table, and we give you thanks for making us a part of your vast family. May we see in one another your light and your love. Having feasted together, may we learn to celebrate our uniquenesses, knit us together in the fellowship of Christ, the reflection of your glory and the imprint of your very being. We offer ourselves our lives, our resources, to you, O oh God. Use us as your hands, reaching into the world in love and compassion. We are your children. Hear our prayer. God of creation, we pray for the earth and all her creatures, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the people of the land. We pray, O oh God, for all those who have been impacted by Hurricane Helene, all those who find themselves without a secure place to nest and rest, all those who are worried and afraid, all those who wonder what tomorrow will bring. May all creation have what they need to flourish and to worship you, each in their own way. We are your children. Hear our prayer. God of peace, we pray for those living in poverty or violence, for those who are mourning loved ones and those who have fled their homes in the wake of gang violence in Haiti, for all those caught up in the escalating conflict in Israel and Gaza and Lebanon and Iran. 
in places of complex suffering and conflict. Teach us, O oh God, to cherish all people. We are your children. Hear our prayer. God of healing, we pray for the sick and suffering. We pray especially today for Suzanne Caterberg's father, Angelo, as he returns home from the hospital. May he receive the care that he needs, O oh God, that he might experience healing. May those who suffer be soothed with tenderness and strength. We are your children. Hear our prayer. God of joy, we join with those who are celebrating this week. We pray especially for our sister Darla. She is, dis she is awarded a Distinguished Alumni Award from Northwestern College. We join with them, God, in celebrating Darla's gifts and contributions in your name. May all those who celebrate this day know the joy of your reign. We are your children. Hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray all these things in the name of our brother, Jesus Christ, who welcomes us into your family. Amen. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit for our song of sending. It's number 708 in our red hymnal. Here on Jesus Christ, I will stand. <laughs> Quake Jesus nasi mama, di e mamba ni salama, di e mamba ni salama, di e mamba ni salama. Here on Jesus Christ I will stand. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ, the solid rock of my life. There's no other place I can hide till the storm that rages subside. My arms rise to God from the flood, and I'm saved because of God's blood. Here on Jesus Christ I will stand. Christ, the solid rock of my life. Christ, the solid rock of my life. Christ, the solid rock of my life. It is not the work of my hands that has washed away all my sins. I'm redeemed and all of my days. Jesus Christ will be my heart's praise. Here on Jesus Christ I will stand. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ the solid rock of my life. When my days on this earth are done, and I stand at God's holy throne. My heart will not have any fear. In Christ's righteousness I am here. Here on Jesus Christ I will stand. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ the solid rock of my life. Christ the solid rock of my life. Remember your invitation to the potluck right after worship today. And now I invite you to raise your hands as a sign of our unity in Christ. Uh, as we go from this place, Jesus holds us so we can try and try again to live into the reality of our solidarity and go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.